welcome to the Payroll Podcast with your host, Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. Hello and welcome to the Payroll Podcast. My name is Nick Day from James Gray Associates and today I am joined by Helen Patterson, who is a workplace expert with an in-depth knowledge in employer culture brand and program strategy. Now, Helen is based in Canada. She previously worked for and at ADP Canada, helping them to develop their HR technology and their HR and payroll service. And she was also involved in moving them to a human capital management company from a traditional payroll firm. Helen was their representative on two Canadian government committees with the Canadian Payroll Association, where she helped to shape changes to legislation that impacted payroll providers and employers And subsequently, Helen is now extremely familiar with the compliance side of both payroll and HR tech, as well as best practices for building client and user-friendly tools. At the moment, Helen is an author of two HR publications for Thomson Reuters. She's also a very experienced blogger covering all areas of HR, and she runs her own small consultancy called LifeWorks Well, which is something that helps organizations create high-performance, people-focused workplaces. And it's something I'm really keen to find out more about in this podcast. She's very good at engaging a captive audience, which she's done on a number of occasions for Disrupt HR and the Canadian Payroll Association. And she's been involved in the HRPA's annual conferences as well. So I'm really excited to have her on this payroll podcast. She has a real focus on helping employers develop a culture that puts the employee's health and well-being first. So we're going to find out a lot more about that today. And her mantra is hashtag human first. Uh, but for now, welcome, Helen. Welcome to the payroll podcast. Oh, thank you so much, Nick. I'm really excited to be here. I really appreciate the opportunity to have a chat with you. Me too. I'm really excited to get started. For those that aren't familiar with the podcast strategy, we always start with a questions one to five. Five quick questions. Just to kick things off, you've obviously held senior roles at ADP Helen in Canada. We talked about a little bit about that in the introduction. But in particular, you've been involved in compliance and product compliance, marketing, over about a five-year period, I think. So as you're quite familiar with payroll and podcasts, I know you've done some of your own podcasts for ADP as well in the past, I wondered if you could just give us a little bit more of an insight into your journey to date, telling us a little bit more about how you got into payroll and, and your experience. Sure, that's great. It's really interesting because I never thought I would end up working so closely with the payroll professionals and payroll technology. And I have to say, my opportunity at ADP Canada really made me appreciate the value that payroll professionals bring. They're so undervalued and they are so taken for granted as employees. We get our paycheck, you know, we sign up, we have to fill out some forms potentially. And so it's just really, really under the radar. So I really enjoyed that stint. Looking back, though, I have an employment and HR law background. So my career started really in law. One of my roles was head counsel of litigation for a large retail organization in Canada. I had to manage a lot of files, but the employment law, the HR, all of the compensation things I handled internally. So that's where, you know, I started to learn about employment standards, statutory holiday pay, vacation pay, termination and severance pay, call and pay, you know, all of these things, CPP, income tax. And I also, with that role, and then as employment law counsel at CIBC, so the first job was really as in-house counsel, learning about all of this. and because we operated in every province across the country. So I had to learn nuances between all of our jurisdictions here. And I also had to help with the HR team design compensation plans, stock option plans, and all of those payroll components when you're hiring and firing, not even really realizing it's connected to payroll, really. Then I sort of shifted back to HR. When I came to ADP Canada, It was quite a new role, and that's where I really started to delve deep into helping them embed compliance components within the software. So that's sort of how I ended up getting to ADP Canada and starting to work with CPA as the ADP representative, and I think we're going to cover some of that a little bit later. So it was sort of not intentional, (laughs) 
but uh, I had my own business for about seven years, the life works well. And, and then an opportunity at ADP Canada came up, you know, with this compliance role. And I thought, wow, this is really interesting. And the benefit was, of course, it was about a 10 minute drive from home and to the kids' schools and everything. It just was, well, this is a really great opportunity and to learn something, get even more embedded in it. So that's how I ended up getting to the payroll experience. Great. I, I picked up a couple of words that you mentioned. The first thing you said, not intentional. I think that seems to be a common thread for people that have ended up working in payroll. I don't think anyone to date that we've interviewed certainly has sort of set out on a career in payroll and it's always become not intentional. But actually, once they've got involved in the profession, it's kind of hooked them. They've really enjoyed it. I think something that's quite interesting is you said that it's uh, right at the start, it's a profession that's often undervalued. Coming from your law background, before you had to learn all about the statutory laws and the statutory process involved in Canadian payroll, did you personally undervalue it as well? And was it a bit of a, a learning curve, if you like, to suddenly, I never knew payroll was so complex? It's funny. I don't know that I'm undervalued because for me, if you learn more about me and my human first hashtag and everything, I really appreciate people regardless. Uh, you know, I've had a humble background, so I've had to put myself through school and I've had jobs in factories and flipping burgers and receptionists. And so it's behind the scenes and no one really knows what everybody's doing. You know, you show up and you fill out a few forms when you're hired. And back then, of course, everything was manual, as you know, <laughs> and uh, you you'd kind of take it for granted. So obviously with the law, I definitely started to appreciate and understand the complexity because I have to tell you, statutory holiday pay legislation and what needs to be done is so complex in Canada, it's ridiculous. It has been like this thing that has followed me in my career. Every company <laughs> I've gone to, it's like stat holiday pay headaches, right? It's like, I can't get away from this. Leave me alone, right? Because it is, I mean, for part timers, there's different calculations, you know, there's, you know, you want to press a button, but, you know, technology as it was designed years ago, it wasn't like that, right? So that's why these technology companies have to evolve too, because we sure. are now in a global market with freelancers and we're changing here in Canada. There's been quite a few legislative overhauls because some of our employment standards laws have been in place for over 40 years and they just don't work for today's society. You know, and living wages, you probably heard about all those things over in the UK as well. You know, I just really learned so much and enjoyed so much about all these nuances. Same thing with vacation pay. It's never cut and dry. And because of the different nature of employment relationships or the contract with the company, it's very complex. It's not one rule. So it's really, really interesting. And just the HR payroll relationships can be improved. Sometimes payroll is part of finance. Sometimes it's part of HR. And so I have to say it's just been, I think, an overlooked profession. And now people I've met have been outstanding. And in Canada with the Canadian Payroll Association, they've really upped credentials and the profession has been highlighted more as a career path for well, new HR students. I think that's fantastic. We're, we're seeing similar things over here in the UK. So definitely it can be based within finance or HR, but we're trying, hopefully with use of this podcast as well, to try and raise the profile so it has more parity. Um, now, I know that in your experience, you've got a lot of expertise in embedding regulatory payroll requirements into payroll products at ADP, and you're obviously quite got your finger on the pulse, if you like, when it comes to technology and when it comes to employee cultures and all those things we're going to get into in a little bit more detail in a moment. But in relation to the tech side of things, are there any particular technologies that you're seeing in Canada that are already affecting Pearl HR operations or, or do you think they're going to start to come in? Oh, yes, I think so. It's interesting. When I joined ADP Canada in 2013, they had been moving from a payroll company to an HCM technology company and then into HR services. So many of the traditional payroll companies here are really looking at the whole employee life cycle, so to speak. So, and how you can integrate from the time of hire and having that pay move through other parts of the technology software. So it's not just a simple human resources information system anymore. 
So it's, it's been quite interesting. I think one of the things I think that is going to be, you know, obviously datafication. Josh Burson, who's an expert over here, has been talking about it since 2015, HR analytics, which includes analysis of compensation and benefits and pay rates and time off. So that we've been hearing about, as you know, for a few years. But what I have found interesting, one of the things that has been in the West side of our country, so out in like BC and Saskatchewan, the prairies, Alberta, so the West side, there's been um, quite a bit of growth in the use of pay cards. So pay cards instead of having a bank account and with new generations. And they do this in the States. And ADP had a a card called Align. And so they were looking at Canada regulations, but they put their pay on pay cards. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. We'll have to see if that's going to be a growth area or not. Again, there's always so many regulatory things that go with that. Sure. I think obviously you've been probably hearing a lot about blockchain. I wouldn't say a lot. I think it's, um, I've done a, a little bit of a series of articles to try and educate the, the payroll market. I think it's, we're just starting to see bits and pieces come out now about the future of payroll and blockchain. Mm-hmm. Certainly the, the payroll yes. card system is something we don't have in the UK as far as I'm aware. So that's quite an interesting potential mm-hmm. development for the future for boys over here. Yeah. So I will be interested to see what happens with blockchain. Things happen pretty slow, as you know, like even though with the pace of change is so quick, but even like technology being updated and enhanced, it takes a long time to change, especially for payroll players who have been around for a long time where they had already built. Right. And their mainframes are connected and everything else. So now I think that the newer players and the startups and the ones that can build from scratch are probably learning about all the headaches and able to maybe address them a bit smoother. So because even, you know, if you think about online pay stubs, that took forever to get. There's still people that get the hard copy paychecks, right? So and that's, you know, those are things that take a long time. But direct deposit, you know, you had to get consent from employees here. And the law, believe it or not, that was the requirement you had thing. And we're like, come on, like 80% of people are doing it anyway. That's where the Canadian Payroll Association and their members would, you know, which I participated as a member on some of these committees, we would sit with the government and say, you know, we need legislative change takes so long. Governments change and then you're dealing with new governments and it's just, come on, let's get with the 21st century. What I think is interesting about the blockchain is that there is this whole encryption and making things anonymous and that protection potentially is there for information rather than going through this third party and paying them on both sides, both employers and the payroll vendors or, you know, having bank accounts, all those fees. So it'll be interesting to see what might happen there. The other thing, as you know, is I think mobile payroll has been building. People are now able to check with the newer generations, obviously, and everybody. It's simple. You can check your payroll online. You can do time management, time schedules, self-service type of stuff. So, you know, I think that's kind of where we're at right now. You mentioned uh, Um, analytics. And in the UK, one of the things that um, I guess people have been afraid of or or wary of maybe is um, robotic process automation. So the idea that the mundane tasks will be automated. That kind of links to your analytics piece, really, because as that becomes automated, there's going to be the payroll position in the UK is going to change to become more analytical based on the data that they're going to have more time to analyze as a result of things like RPA. Yeah. And actually, you know, when I I had been thinking about this, I actually had AI in the back of my head because that's such a topical thing here. Right. And globally, artificial intelligence and whether, again, looking at productivity efficiencies and how can some of this take over. One of the other things that's really interesting is I don't know if it's the same in the UK, but even the governments themselves from a technological standpoint is it takes a long time to have change. Yeah. So when I started out in my profession years ago at CIBC and HR and, you know, even government websites have changed so much in 10 years, right? Sure. So the amount of information that's available and as an example here in Canada, Ontario and Alberta, that if employers aren't compliant and they've been found to like get fines because they haven't paid correctly, 
Yeah. So say they have a paid or statutory holiday or severance pay or vacation pay. They actually put the company's name on their website. So they've been doing a lot, a lot of audits here on that because of this underground economy. And people sometimes just don't know, whereas that's where these outsourcing or payroll providers, like they know what to do if they can embed all these clients rules in there for you and help you minimize having to do manual work or, you know, you don't always understand you're growing your business, you're focused on selling and products. And your last thing is like thinking about all of this, but you should be right. It should be a a higher priority and it's not always. So, so that's been kind of interesting. AI, yeah, the whole robotics thing, because I had come up with a word before about, you know, simplification. We want to make things simpler, not more complex. And so even governments are looking like, how do we make it easier where we're going to get information? As an example, when you leave an organization, you have to file records of employment. Yeah. And automating that has been happening where you can do a lot online and sorry, employees can get something digitally now. So it creates a quicker process. Sure. You know, it's easier when there's a set payroll run, as you know, but a lot of the better, the improvements are, you know, off cycle you know, when someone's terminating in the middle of a pay cycle. And so those are those improvements, but also making life easier. Like if I'm hiring someone, age restrictions, when do they start paying into the Canada pension plan? Because students start younger now and there's age restrictions. So having a system like where, oh, wait a minute, you can't put this person in. It's automated, right? So it's looking at those, how it runs and where you can make those simple I'm saying simple, but behind the scenes, we've got all these coders and sure. having worked with all the tech, sitting with technology folks and realizing, and even for me being a client, when I was working with our outsourced vendor to try to get one code change, it's a very, you know, for one code, adding a new leave code or something, it's not always that easy. Right? No, no, well, payroll's complex, isn't it? So it's even harder sometimes than payroll to make one change. can sometimes involve a number of different processes and there. Uh, and amendments from a coding perspective. But it doesn't surprise me you've been involved in that kind of work. Because I know that you're a huge advocate for creating healthy workplaces. So if you can make things simpler, that's obviously something that's quite close to your heart. And I'm assuming that's probably part of what's behind your business, your Life Works Well consulting business, which you launched in 2008. I know that you've got a lot of experience in sort of creating amazing workplace cultures. So can you talk to me a little bit more about that kind of work and what your beliefs are sort of going forward? Yes. And this is really where that holistic view is important. Every employee is to be valued, right? Whether you are opening the door for people or greeting them at Walmart, as an example, or right through to, you know, the floor. And so my human first mantra, it's funny. I started using this hashtag a while back. When I left CIBC, I was after my second child was born. I went back for a brief period of time, but then I realized, you know what, I was ready for a change and I wanted to be home more. And, and so for me, life works well. Where that came from was how do we create a life that is joyful and happy and working well? Right. And so it kind of was a spin on life work balance and life work harmony and all these terms because I had a big passion for, you know, helping people bridge that life and work and not having that stress involved. So that's how I, I sort of came up to it. And I loved my very first role in my consultancy was with a woman who, uh, her name is Nora Spinks and she's been a mentor to me. And she had a company called Work Life Harmony and she had been a consultant for years. So she actually worked with the government and helped them create this employment insurance for maternity leave and parental leave. She was involved in creating those supports for workers. Right. So when you leave, you actually have a bit of financial support through the government. And so that's where I had such a great time and it just aligned with me, even as a manager at CIBC. I didn't even think twice about giving flexibility to my workers and Work can get done in many different ways. It's the outcome that's important. It doesn't matter if you're home for a bit or you want to drop your kids at school or you have an appointment you need to get to. I trust that you're going to, you know, still deliver. Sure. And um, I had some interesting experiences. I actually hired a woman 
who was pregnant. And she's like, are you sure? Like, I'm going on maternity leave in like two months. And I'm like, you're the best candidate, you know? Right. <laughs> Einstein famously said that insanity was doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We believe it's time to try a new approach to recruitment. JGA Recruitment specialise in recruiting the top 15% of payroll and HR talent using innovative 24-7 attraction strategies that are proven to improve quality of hire, candidate retention and return on investment. De-risk your recruitment process today and hire better talent faster with JGA Recruitment. Visit jgarecruitment.com to find out more. That's super refreshing yeah. to hear because, you know, that, that doesn't happen often. And the fact that she's still there and did a great job means it was a good decision, right? So, great. Oh, yeah. And the other woman was a single mother who had two young children. And she worked in Ottawa, but our office was in Toronto. And, you know, we did work across the country in employee relations. And I managed a team that did, like, human rights investigations. That was one of my first jobs. And, again, why are you not applying? I knew. So we actually built a little home office where we we spent like two or three thousand dollars. That was all it was to make sure that she had a little locked room for the confidentiality within a room in her home. Yeah. And we made sure it was health and safety. And so she was able to because you still travel. You can do that from everywhere. You don't need to be in an Ottawa office. And it just made her life wonderful for her two children. And she was fantastic at her job. Right. So. And I've taken that with me. So this is what I want to, you know, life works well is about, there's a number of ways to create healthy workplaces. It's life work strategies. It's treating people as humans, having respect in the workplace. So all of the, you don't need the laws if you have the right type of values and respect first, right? You're not going to, you're not going to get into trouble. So it's more the proactive versus reactive role of HR. Right? And interestingly, and so, when you do those kind of things, I'm assuming that what you get back, because they know how much flexibility you've given, how much trust you're showing in them. So presumably you then get that sort of back in space in return because you know, it works both ways. So they know that you've given that faith to set up an office in that room. So she's gonna, that individual's going to go, you know what, I'm going to give everything to this company because they've given everything to me. So it kind of works better for both parties. And that's true. And that's what I experienced too, because... I had a lot of fertility issues. And so when I was actually a senior director, like a very high level role at CIBC, when I moved from the legal into the HR at CIBC, so I needed the flexibility to go for blood tests and, oh, it was a nightmare. But anyway, that's another, that's another (laughs) podcast, Nick. (laughs) They supported me so well. And we had, that's a long story, but we were also trying adoption and all kinds of things. And, I wasn't feeling like I was there for my team. It impacts you. You don't realize, right? But they gave me the supports. And then I had a little bit of a leave of absence at CIBC because I had been going through this for about seven years. And I just said to my boss at the time, I really feel like I need this bit of a break because I'm not feeling like I'm delivering my 100% here for the team and everything else. It was the best thing ever. My boss, you know, supported me for it. I came back refreshed. Actually, I came back pregnant. Oh, wow. can believe it. <laughs> I didn't know. Like the time I left, I was like, oh my gosh. So things happened. But I delivered this huge project and it was like the am- most amazing thing. And my, I remember my boss saying, my manager saying, wow, this is, you know, this is you, Helen. This is like, you're a high performer. And, and it was just again, the support. And I still bank with CIBC today because. Right. As an employee, I was treated so well. Yeah, so I think that that's all about it. Leaders, and you know, we read about this, Nick. We read about this all the time, yet people have such a hard time implementing this and living. And I've talked to so many people about, they realize, like, it's so hard to sometimes describe this kind of culture. Are you able to define culture? Are you able to sort of then come up with a couple of maybe bullet points or step by steps that people can sort of listen to as a strategy, if you like, to help develop high performing payroll teams and operations? And if there's a leader or payroll manager listening to this, what would be the sort of key takeaways or key steps that people can sort of take on board now from listening to this and then maybe implement into their teams? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, It's really interesting because I think the thing is it's taking that step back for a bit and listening and communicating. I think one of the 
biggest challenges is that people are rushing so much in this busyness world we have. Sure. They're not taking that time to pause and, you know, that continuous improvement. I'm sort of came up with this term and I always came up with weird combination terms and I said, <laughs> simplification and innovation, right? So it's all about getting back to those basics sometimes. So taking that and really helping employees be the best they can. And it takes a lot of communication. I think one of the biggest challenges that happen in those organizations where they fall off is they don't communicate well. Sure. And they don't respect and they don't set these like boundaries in a way, right? As far as that and have signs and have that. So it seems so simple sometimes, but it, it's really just going back to, okay, everybody's a human first, right? Right. You have a life outside of work for the most part, other than, I mean, sometimes entrepreneurs, that's their life. They have their purpose, right? But if your mission and your vision and values aligned and you're actually living it, so be proactive. And it's that communicating goals, setting clearly, right? And finding time to have fun, <laughs> I think. Very important. You know, having fun yeah. within it. And I think being there, because everybody is a human, so being there and understanding. And as you know, like organizations are moving more to a coaching environment. Sure, sure. You know, and they're getting rid of annual reviews. So, you know, payroll leaders can do the same thing as any other leader, right? They're... I think you highlighted something that's really important, talking. really important at the moment. Yeah, and it is talking really. It's you know, with RPA coming in here, which is scaring people because payroll people in the UK are worried that you know they may lose their job because it's going to be taken over by a robot. I, I've been trying to say to the UK payroll audience, look, robots can't take over the human element of what you do, and the communicative piece, the amount of responsibility that payroll people have in terms of influencing things like employee engagement, that kind of stuff can't be automated by a robot, in my view. It, you can't take away the, the human intuition, yeah. the human communication piece, the, the bit that's so important in making any business, particularly a payroll function, work optimally. And we're certainly we're seeing as recruiters that payroll communication skills and stakeholder management skills and the ability to communicate complex information uh, in a way that people can understand to improve the process are kind of now more important than we'd ever seen before. And that's the case with every managerial role. You know, I've been in HR for a long time. So one of the biggest challenges has always been to get those managers to move away from the, the business, the day to day and and manage sure. and coach. and those soft skills. So what, you know, I think it's, we're in such a great time right now where there's so much on emotional intelligence and getting rid of ego and moving people to those real human centric focused environments. And if employees are engaged, as you know, and we've read about mm -hmm. it, so I really believe this, that the customers will feel it. They'll skyrocket. People will love to come to work and they love to engage with their colleagues. Think about how much time you spend there. Some people want to go. They don't want to work remote anymore because they love engaging with people and they have fun. One of the other last things I would say, and it's kind of my other passion, as you know, is mentorship. And I think having these payroll managers or leaders find themselves a mentor or mm. a coach to help them along the way is so valuable because people have been there before. And so if you can find someone that's going to help you look at these strategies and know what's worked well and what hasn't in the past from their experiences or peer to peers, even like to share learnings. I've seen mentor circles work with a number of different managers get together and kind of share experiences in confidential way, obviously. Yeah. I think people could do it a lot more. Yeah, I think that's the thing is because, you know, you know what it's like. So many of these innovation or programs, everybody, you know, the leaders often think that it's fluffy or whatever, right? But it really isn't. And what I've seen and studies prove it is that these types of environments are the ones that are going to lead the way. They also have corporate social responsibility and community focus and volunteerism and all of that giving back that the newer generation millennials and then the, the Zeds for sure. The Zed, which is my daughter's generation, she just started uh, university and, you know, they're so immersed in 
community giving and volunteerism is just what they grew up with in high school. Sure. Things, right. And, and even before that, and me to we and you name it. So this is good. Yeah. Now, I'll ask you one more question before we find out a little bit more about you, uh, just to finish off these early questions. But first of all, for those of you that haven't yet subscribed to this channel, perhaps you're listening to the podcast for the very first time, or if you haven't shared it yet or reviewed it on iTunes, please do so. I'm going to go to a very quick payroll podcast specific advert break. Bit of fun. Hope you enjoy it. I'm going to go straight back to one final question before we find out a little bit more about Helen. Enjoy. This is the podcast you really need. Meeting people, helping shape the payroll industry. The Payroll Podcast, this you gotta check. Hosted by Nick Day, bringing in so many guests. Director of JGA Recruitment, Nick Day. Break it down, show them how we do it. From the latest tech and payroll compliance issues. Let's start the conversation, see how we can improve. Yeah, Vicky Graham, Richard George, that's the name of few of the guests that we've had. And so many can through let's uncover these topics and it ain't no debating from gdp or the payroll training workplace psychology so important can't deny you don't want to miss an episode so make sure you subscribe it's the payroll podcast now you can't forget hosted by nick day bringing you the coolest guests yeah the payroll podcast let's elevate your payroll career subscribe now for those in the UK, they won't be familiar, I don't think, with the Canadian payroll laws, if you like. So I read some of your articles that you've written for ADP, and the one that really stuck out for me was the one on pay equity. And I want to touch on this because I think our payroll listeners would really enjoy learning about the pay equity concept, which you have in place in Canada, which I don't think we have, or I'm pretty sure we don't have here in the UK. And I really enjoyed the article. So I wonder if you could just sort of invite listeners on what the pay equity scheme is in Canada. Oh, yes. It's really interesting because just to give listeners in the UK or outside of Canada that might not be familiar or even within Canada, because not everybody always knows this, that we have kind of a unique structure for laws in Canada because we have a federal jurisdiction, which applies to certain types of industries. So we have 10 provinces and three territories. And each of them have different separate laws that apply to workers. But then there's this federal jurisdiction. So when you look at it, I what I say is, well, we really have 14, even though there's only 13 physical <laughs> places. So right there, there's a complexity of doing business in Canada, right? So in the federal jurisdiction, it applies to airlines, telecommunication. There's a list of industries. And what's interesting about that is, and the banking industry was one of it. So this is where I learned a lot about federal is that regardless of whether you are working in a branch in Alberta or Ontario or Manitoba, the same law applies to you. Whereas if you're a provincially regulated industry would be like manufacturing or others. If you're operating in only one province, Ontario, those are the laws that apply. Right away, you have to kind of understand that. And so pay equity law doesn't exist in every jurisdiction in Canada. It does apply to the federal. So pay equity has been in place in a different way. I mean, the federal and banking, there's a lot of employment equity and all kinds of things. Ontario, where I live and work, is one of the jurisdictions, as is Quebec, that has pay equity laws. So if you're a business that operates in those, you have to understand pay equity. And so... Many people understand the concept of equal pay for equal work. If I'm a female doing the same and a male and we're both doing an industry analyst job, that's easy to understand. And we have the same level of experience and everything else, then our wages should be essentially the same, right? But what pay equity does is it takes it a step further and it says you must also have equal pay for work of equal value. And that's where the complexity comes in because that means you actually have to assess every role within your organization. You assign points and there's a couple of different methodologies to do this, but you assign a point system to these jobs to determine whether they're the same. So one example would be, is a receptionist job the same level of points as a construction Mm. worker. 
just say in a, in a construction company. If it is yes, if the answer is, hey, they're both worth 80 points, as an example, those two jobs have to also be equal pay. And so that's to going to your salary brands. So what happened was organizations would have to do this process. And then if there was an issue, they would have to make pay equity adjustments. So say the construction worker was, you know, the starting rate was $16 an hour, but receptionists were getting $14 an hour. The company, because there is supposed to be equal pay for work of equal value, then they had to up the receptionist to $16 an hour as a starting point. So I try to make that sound simple, but you can imagine the complexity of the process that goes involved. And there are actually what's really interesting is that there's been a lot of change and there's been a lot of highlight in the U.S. on pay equity. And you read about it everywhere where women are getting paid 70 percent in jobs versus 100 percent equal pay for the same job. But this goes that step further, as I said. So. Yeah, my article, Pay Equity Pays, I wrote like, oh, last year sometime when I was still at ADP Canada. You know, it's kind of interesting because when I worked as an in-house counsel for Venator Group, which was the company that owned Foot Locker and Champs and all the retail arms, we had it. Like we had it back then and we had to make sure we were doing proactively pay equity analysis. And so it had been around for some time, but people just didn't even know it existed. And so until you had the the Ministry of Labor knocking at your door, and I mentioned earlier about employment standards, they were increasing audits. Well, both in Ontario and Quebec, the governments have been increasing audits on pay equity. And so now there's a few niche players that have developed. Professionals in the UK can be quite thankful that we... Well, I'll say thankful since they don't have to process it. Probably not thankful they don't have it. It sounds like a very good scheme. We've got the gender pay gap reporting, which has come in here, talking about trying to highlight businesses where there's definitely a difference between what they're paying male counterparts or female counterparts for the same role. You can get exposed, but like you mentioned earlier, in the UK, if you're a certain size business that has a, a gender pay gap. So I'll actually say that sort of takes it another level forward. Yeah. Yeah, so the gender pay gap, I was aware of that UK when I was at ADP, we were researching because I worked closely with legal and our global partners. Mm -hmm. And here's an interesting thing. So think about that. I mean, a lot of companies and then countries follow suit. Actually, right? Canada's been very progressive in this and same thing with human rights, right? We, We seem to be well beyond others sometimes. But what is interesting from a payroll technology perspective is that in the U.S., because of the similar reporting requirements they had, which the UK is going to be doing, they created some technology to help employers. And I think that's where I was saying earlier about if you can have it embed and be innovative about how that pay data is going to be used in different ways and create reports, imagine how easy that would be. And even if you had an auditor coming in as a company and you're able to just spit out your data, right? (laughs) It's very interesting times, I think. And so it's really important, especially in Canada, you know, we see that organizations are taking a look at, you know, structuring this. Uh, But I think, you know, the newer generation and women, we're getting a lot. Yeah, we're going to find out a little bit more about your advocacy for promoting women leadership in a little while. Before we do so, I'd like to just go through a quick, quick fire round with you so we can educate the audience to find out a bit more about you, really. Time to find out more about you. So if you're happy to run through a couple of quick questions where we can find out more about yourself, Helen, that would be fat. Number one, how would your friends describe you and how would your work colleagues describe you? You know, it's funny you ask that because I have been working with a coach this year. This was something a little bit newer for me. I've had mentors in the past, but I've actually worked with uh, a coach and One of the exercises they had asked was for me to go out to friends and colleagues and family and ask them to like, say, why is Helen awesome? And what is she the go-to person for? So it's kind of funny when you see what other people look at you. But I would say that a lot of my closer friends and people that know me well say I'm pretty funny. (laughs) I like to laugh. I like to have fun. Kind and caring. You know, I really am a, a giver. I really feel like that's kind of who I am. So they would probably use some of those words. You know, I like to get out of my comfort zone. 
colleagues, I think they'd say a lot of the same thing, but I think that I am one of those positive yeah. people. Yeah, colleagues and like a definitely look for the silver lining type of person, you know, get it going, energetic. Uh, your passion is definitely coming across. So I would, uh, I don't know who, as well as your friends and colleagues would know you, but I can vouch to say that that's probably the same way I would describe it in the short time we've got to know each other. So more than fair, I think. Tell me something about you then that perhaps other people won't know about you. Gosh, I'm kind of, you know, I'm pretty open, right? And transparent. So people kind of get to know me. I am who I am, right? I kind of put it out there. I think a lot of people wouldn't know. I might have mentioned this earlier that I actually, you know, came from a pretty humble background, you know, not a lot of income in my family. So I'm only one of five children that I was the only one that went to like university and I actually put myself wow. through school. So I always had to work. I worked like almost full time during my undergrad because I was a legal secretary. So they may not have known that because well, I'm aging yeah. myself now because that doesn't show yeah. up on my LinkedIn, but, but great skills to have, right? So something a little bit different. You're abducted by aliens who want to learn more about our species. What item would you take with you? <laughs> oh, gosh, that's a, I've never heard that one before. Will the iPad? Yeah, well, you won't be the first to mention the iPad. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's funny. You know what? I think I would want to have a photo. You can have that on your iPad as well, right? Um, yeah. So if I could have that, because I would want to have that cool. as comfort, because that would be pretty scary, <laughs> wouldn't it? <laughs> what, what game or instrument would you teach them? Well, I've always wanted to learn an instrument, so I can't help on that front. But uh, on my list of things to do before I go, you know, try to learn piano or something. But a game. Hmm, there's a lot of fun games, but lately we've been focusing on ah, chess in the house. Nice, so nice. Probably I'm a big chess. chess. My son kicks yeah. my butt though. <laughs> he's really good. He's 11 and he's he's really good. He's uh, so I kind of have been playing a lot more. Of that so excellent, probably chess. Excellent. Uh, what do you tell them about humans? Oh gosh, we are very complex, very. aren't we? I so, what truth or human trait that. would you hold back from telling them about humans? Um, I wouldn't want them to know about narcissism and maybe good <laughs> egos, right? And you know, from getting to know me a little bit already and my human first, right? It's One of the things I want to find out more about is I know that you're a huge advocate for promoting women in leadership. Uh, we're not just women in leadership, also motherhood in the workplace, and you've touched upon that a little bit already. Can you tell us more about sort of why this in particular is important to you, what you've seen in the market, and I guess more importantly, how you view the future? Yeah, this is such an exciting time, I think. You know, even when I went to law school, I'm pretty sure we were already getting closer to like 40, 50 percent of the students were female. And so seeing women get into STEM more and my daughter's in science. So that's pretty cool. So technology, math is being encouraged. Right now, I'm part of an organization I joined last year that is called CEO. Okay which is pretty cool. And it's such an amazing group. A woman named Vicki Saunders who started this, her vision is to have a $1 billion perpetual fund that is for women entrepreneurs. And she's gone to Canada, Australia, US, a few other countries. She wants to do this globally. And it's so amazing because I joined as an activator, which yeah. means I just gave my money. And I wasn't expecting anything in return. It was just like a membership fee sort of thing. And it was my contribution. So what they do is they collect this. We, as a person that contributes, gets to vote on which entrepreneurs get to uh, have access to this fund, depending on how much they raise. And so, you know, last year there were $700,000 that was shared by seven young women startups, not even all young. I just think it's wonderful. And women in leadership, obviously, large organizations. I mean, you've read studies about it, right? There's still a very small gap with women in those leadership roles. And what I'd love to see more is women who are family, because I found in my experience, a lot of times the women that have been on the leadership team have been women that don't have children or their children have grown and they're gone off. So they have more free time, but it's tough because it's that trade off, right? So supporting that motherhood and fatherhood too. I love that, you know, more men are taking parental leave now. 
at CIBC, there was a young lawyer, and I think he might have been the first lawyer to take a leave, a parental leave, paternity leave for having that. So I think it's really, really important. I'm involved in a few other organizations. I mentor some young women, which I always find is reciprocal anyway, because uh-huh. I'm just uh-huh. as much from them. In the future, I would love to continue to see that women's careers aren't necessarily penalized in a way because they, yeah. they have a family. So yeah, very passionate about that. I love supporting women and women's causes and things With like the, that. With so. um, increased number of agile, supportive workplaces and the ability to work from home that really hopefully less opportunities for employers to discriminate based on a mother working from home. Because you know what? If they've got the facilities to work and they're able to to work in an agile environment, then there's no way they should be discriminated against someone who doesn't have those commitments. Definitely. And I mean, a lot of companies, you know, especially in the tech industry, I think there's a lot of remote workers because sometimes those commutes are so long. You know, you're going to have much more productive people if they're healthy. That's kind of going back to my life works well is creating these types of programs that help people be their best self, right? You're healthy. You're not driving three hours a day trying to get to the soccer game. You're actually getting 10 hours of work done in a day because you're at home and you actually are closer to the drop off and things like that. So I think there's a lot that can be done to support that in organizations that Again, that giving back, like what you get, the support you get as a, an employee, yeah. right? So that links in with your Team hashtag, right. doesn't it, of human first. Something that you're really passionate about. But if I was a payroll manager at the moment listening to this podcast, how would you recommend that they utilize your hashtag human first or slogan, if you like, to help improve the success of their payroll teams and perhaps, and perhaps the people they're responsible for? Yeah, I think we've touched on this quite a bit, you know, recognizing that there is this life outside of the organization. I think flexibility is how I would describe it the most. And that's something that's, there's been a lot of research in, here in Canada. And even some of our governments have gone out with studies on flexibility and potentially even sure. legislating it, if you can believe it. You would think that it's understandable, but that is, I think that that's where is like getting to know people for who they are, right? Outside of their role and respect, right? It's all intertwined in a way that you're going to get so much more out of your employees if you approach it that way. And so payroll managers, we talked a lot about this earlier, about the people side and the soft skills side is that when you recognize that people have interests and passions and, you know, they like to run outside of the workforce or they, you know, they're gardeners or, you know, it just, it's really bringing that, those values in and that proactive strategies sure. versus reacting and coaching, right? So if you know what the skill sets are or, you know, it's interesting. There's a lot of debate right now about whether it's strength or you build from strengths in your team or you can create good habits. So your people are all going to be different too. So they're not all cog, you know, as opposed to this. So even though those aliens find out we're complex, I mean, sometimes that's a good thing. Now, before we finish this podcast, I know that um, the listeners out there will be really keen to find out more about some of the expertise you've had over what is a 20-year history working in a diverse number of positions across payroll and HR. So I wondered if you could share some examples or an example of a project you've worked on that required some innovative out-of-the-box style thinking. So I know that's something that you've always been able to do across all of your employers. So if there's a particular example of a project where you've needed some innovation um, and perhaps you, you've thought outside of the box, I wonder if you could share it with, with the listeners. Yeah, that's a great one because I've, I've been involved in some really exciting things over the years. Kind of linking it to payroll, I can, one project comes to mind, which was dealing with compassionate care leave. And I don't know if you have something like that over in the UK, but here, this was introduced way back, I would say at least 10 years ago or something, but it was unique at the time in that the government was going to support, like they do with parental leave and maternity leave, support employees to take time off and to get some pay when a family member was near the end of their life. So it's kind of like the opposite. You have this birth, beautiful, and this is very difficult time. And so I was very, very proud of how 
most of the times you just think about it and you just put in a, uh, you know, put in the laws and that's it. But with this, we really pushed the team. I managed a policy subcommittee at the time and a couple of us pushed our executives to say, Hey, let's look at something different. Let's like enhance our employer brand here and do something really unique and try to do something. So we created a whole bunch of tools and we ended up asking the senior executives to support some additional pay for these employees during this very difficult time. And so to get 100% of their salary. And so I was very proud about that because we had to push for that and we actually had to get the advocacy part Mm -hmm. of it. And we ended up being the first bank to do it. And they went out with press releases and all kinds of stuff like that. And of course, all the other banks followed. So that was pretty cool. That was a lot of fun. Really quickly, one other one on the ADP side, which was, again, more recently, which was, I think, quite innovative, was launching the HR services in addition to payroll and HCM technology, being the first one in Canada to kind of combine it all. So that was very, very exciting, quite a journey. I was primarily involved with the content development. And so what was wonderful about it is that for businesses that couldn't necessarily afford a huge human resources department, they could partner with ADP and have, you know, one-stop shopping almost. So they could get employee handbooks, policies, programs, pay equity. They partnered with uh, a company that was an expert so they could provide that too. So I feel this was very, very innovative in the market. And I brought a lot of my skill set to that in leading that content development and partnering with other organizations to get it going. Eventually, the intent is that it becomes probably all in-house. But you know, you have to get to business sometime and get to market. So I was able to leverage partnerships with a number of other large Canadian organizations, but also build out internal expertise and get the standard operating procedures in place for that. Great content in the small business market too. We did the same thing. So not only for large organizations, but for those smaller businesses that don't even probably have anybody in HR, (laughs) Um, you know, a general manager doing so they would have tools, including recruitment guides. And so that was a whirlwind, I have to say, but I really feel like that was, you know, out of the box. How are we going to get there? How are we going to make it easy? What's relevant to them? You know, you're going to make mistakes sometimes on the way to figure out what content is going to be used. Sure. And, you know, what mechanism is just like learning and development, trying new things. So that was very exciting as well. Workplace culture and tech expertise to find out how you think payroll and HR departments will evolve in the future. Oh, wow. You know, I think we've touched on this a little bit with the robotics coming in, globalization. And I think I mentioned at the beginning where I really believe there needs to be a little bit more synergy between payroll and HR. As a partnership, I think that the expectation is that there is continuous learning and that the efficiencies and productivity is still something that's top of mind for obviously the leaders. But I really believe with these newer generations, you know, there's apps coming out every day, (laughs) you know, as far as different technology. So I think that you know, the social connection and having the ability to do mobile, you know, everything at your fingertips is definitely something that I think is going to going to continue to evolve. And I think that there will be more, you know, this whole minimum wage, living wage, legislative changes, flexibility, freelance environment. I think we're going to see a lot more of traditional payroll companies looking at using those technologies to pay these types of people as opposed to doing it separately on an accounts payable system. Yeah. I think they have to, you know, start looking at, you know, an all in one because that is something that is already happening now a little bit. So that's a lot. And I just think continuously like this whole emotional intelligence and bringing back people skills and soft skills into workplace culture is something that 
organizations are continuing to look at and community involvement, volunteerism. So if those companies focus on those types of things, they're going to really innovate and um, be the leaders in the future. No, I think that's a great way to finish because I think that's something that, you know, I'm really keen to stress to pay all people out there at the moment is that so- those soft skills, that human element piece, it's not going to go away. It's going to become more and more important. So don't be fearful of the robots, just uh, confident in your your own you know, human soft skills and experiences and utilize those to, to deliver a really good payroll function. So we're going to open the vault to finish this podcast. Entering the vault. One piece of advice you would give to someone working in payroll right now. Well, I think you've heard the theme already. Continue to learn, really yeah. keep up and continue to grow and find yourself a mentor or a coach, someone that you can go to and help bring you to those next levels. So Fantastic. it's kind of two things, but I think they go hand in hand. Absolutely. With the benefits of hindsight, what would be the one career decision you would change? Aren't we supposed to say to this, Nick, that, you know, our journey took us here. <laughs> it did, it did. This is what was, yeah. But you know what? I have to say there is one thing and it's sometimes I don't have any regrets. So think of it that way because it's all been great, great learning. That's my, I love to learn. Sure. But I think in hindsight, when I was going to law school, I had an opportunity to do a combined MBA. And I think for me, part of my career, like, I think that would have been helpful. I've had to learn a lot of the business skills on the job, but I think having a little bit more focus on the business side first is really, really beneficial because I think that's where HR has had to go. That's where payroll has to go. You're always supporting the mission of that organization and the vision. And so having that business insight earlier in my career would have probably, you know, helped me a little bit, but I still, I, I've loved every, every journey and every moment I, yes. I've grown a lot and I continue to, and I'll probably never stop. So there you go. Well, excellent. That sounds good to me. So if you had the power of foresight and could change the entire payroll industry with one action or improvement, what would that action or improvement be? Ooh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. You know what? I think it aligns with me, right? Bringing that, you know, the people side back in to the industry, to every industry, right? But really bringing in that human first element and the support, you know, so much is wrapped up in that as far as appreciation, you know, engagement, recognition. Uh, so I think that if we could change it to be so much more valued, you know, leadership valuing the function, that would be fantastic. Excellent. Fantastic. Who motivates you and why? Oh, my goodness. I'm motivated by many, many, but, um, you know, does it have to be one? I've had good mentors along the way. I would say one of my colleagues right now, because I think there's always different people that motivate me, but right now, I have a colleague whose name is Elizabeth Williams, who I met at ADP Canada and She's on a journey and she's just brilliant. She is such a go-getter and she is just always continuing to be my accountability partner. So pushing me to question whether that decision is really aligned to what I, my vision. And so I really feel like that friendship and relationship and mentorship has really grown with her. So yeah, I'd say that right now. She's one of my motivators for sure. Excellent. Fantastic. And last question. If you didn't work in payroll, what would you be doing? Learning to play piano. <laughs> so that's that I a great could teach answer. the aliens answer. how to play. <laughs> you know what? I, I kind of, you know, have a lot more focus on this mentorship right now. So I'd say that's what it's probably, you know, going to be this culture and mentor. I'm sort of shifting into that but obviously all the payroll and all the compliance is still always a piece of it but i want to focus Excellent. more on that thank you so much for joining us today on the on the uh, payroll podcast for anyone who is interested in finding out more about life works well or more about helen please do visit her website hp.lifeworkswell.ca there's a wealth of information on there. there's a number of really interesting blogs and really interesting articles 
So I definitely recommend you take a look. Um, I'll also put a link, if it's okay with yourself, Helen, to your LinkedIn profile if anyone wants to get in touch. So this is the last podcast before Christmas. So I want to take this opportunity to wish everybody a wonderful Christmas and a very happy new year. Thank you ever so much for listening to the Paywall podcast and subscribing to this channel. We've got some fantastic episodes already planned for next year. Kicking us off is going to be an interview with two individuals from the American Payroll Association. Stay tuned. Have a great festive period. And I will look forward to speaking to you all again in the new year 2019. You've been listening to the Payroll Podcast with Nick Day of JGA Recruitment, Specialist Payroll Recruiters. If you would like to feature on a future podcast, please contact us. For a wealth of world-class payroll content, please visit us at jgarecruitment.com. See you next week.